Hey, I'm Nate Fawson. I'm a professional archaeologist currently excavating in northern Texas, and I specialize in the archaeology of the indigenous peoples of North America prior to colonization by Europeans, especially in the region that we call the Eastern Woodlands. I've been working in this region for more than 10 years, so I've got a fair amount of experience to draw on as I make these videos. This video is going to cover what we know about what is arguably the most enigmatic archaeological site in the Eastern Woodlands. I've mentioned it several times in other videos, the monumental earthwork known to archaeologists as Poverty Point in Louisiana. The first thing we have to bear in mind when talking about this monument is that the people who built it were egalitarian hunter-gatherers. Obviously, some person or more likely group of people was organizing the construction of the earthwork, but there's no indication that these individuals were seen as having any kind of institutional authority to make people work on this mon monument and make it compulsory. There's no tomb for a pharaoh anywhere at Poverty Point, as far as we can tell. The entire undertaking appears to be the product of collective consensus action and seems to be related to some kind of common religious affiliation. So let's start with site history, and I'll be using the standard calibrated before present or CalBP date system that we use in archaeology because that's how the radiocarbon dates are presented in all of my sources. Just know that when I say CalBP, it basically means years ago in, in layman's terms. So the majority of the monument was created during the late Archaic, but it was built in reference to an earlier Middle Archaic monument called the Lower Jackson Mound, which was built somewhere around 5,000 years BP. So you can see on the map that mounds B, A, and E are all built on a north-south axis aligned to the Lower Jackson Mound. Before anything monumental was built at Poverty Point, the complex proper, there was a small village complex, and excavations at this settlement produced spear points that can be classified to a few dozen formal types, which for this time and place is extremely unusual. Typically, you only get two or three point types at any given time and place. This suggests that the location was already a place of cultural convergence. Multiple groups of people were coming to this place and staying regularly and interacting with each other. So Mount B was built first around 3,600 Cal BP, and about 200 years after the initial construction, uh, or 3,400 BP, it was capped with a final layer of soil and was not modified again after that. We think that Mount E was built around the same time, but we don't have a direct radiocarbon date to back that up yet. Around the same time that Mount B was completed, the series of ditch and bank structures were built on top of the semicircular village complex that had been occupied before the construction of Mount B that I already talked about. Construction began on Mount C around the same time as the embankments, and the construction was ongoing until it was capped uh, between 3,300 and 3,200 Cal BP, so over the course of about a century or two. The final phase was the construction of the largest mound, Mount A. This mound is the most substantial earthwork in the entire eastern woodlands up until the construction of Monk's Mound at Cahokia 2,000 years after Poverty Point was abandoned. So in the construction of this mound, first the vegetation in the swamp that was to form the base of Mound A was burned off around 3,200 Cal BP. A fill of gray silt was deposited and then covered over rapidly with soils of varying colors. And because the lack of erosion on the surface of that gray silt layer and the frequency of rain in Louisiana, it's extremely unlikely that initial construction of this mound took more than two months, requiring a labor force in excess of a thousand members. So the it rains at least, there's no point where it doesn't rain for an entire two months, in, for more than two months in this region of Louisiana. You always get some rain within a two month period. So there's really no way that they could have prepared that surface that gray silt surface, and had it not be covered over within that time frame, because we'd see rivulets and ripples in the erosion uh, pattern in, in those soils. So the entire complex was abandoned around a century later, around 3,100 BP, and a cache of destroyed soapstone bowls was deposited around this time. The significance of Poverty Point isn't just in the monumental earthworks, it's also not just in the artifacts, but in what those artifacts tell us about the significance of this place on the Louisiana landscape. So steatite or soapstone is a very soft rock found in the Appalachian Mountains 
that is easily carved. You can carve it with your thumbnail. And this material was used during the late archaic period to make bowls for cooking. These vessels were manufactured and transported in massive quantities to the Poverty Point site, which would have required very effective trade networks and very high labor costs because the, they're made of rock, they're very heavy, so being able to transport them requires a lot of work. Chipstone tools such as spear points were recovered in large numbers here and from vastly different regions of the country. So the closest sources for tool stone in the area around Poverty Point are a full two-day round trip, but the majority of the stone types found here are from more than 10 times and often as much as 20 times as far away. So Navaculite from Arkansas, Dover Church from Middle Tennessee, Gray Church from the Indiana and Illinois region, all required huge amounts of effort to collect and transport to the site. And between the soapstone and the toolstone, more than 77 tons of exotic stone were recovered at Poverty Point. So people are bringing huge amounts of material from far outside of the local environment. Some of these objects were non-utilitarian, like these owl-shaped beads made of red jasper, which is a form of chert. Red jasper comes from many different sources throughout the eastern woodlands. I tend to find them in the gravel beds around creeks and, and streams. But wherever they were coming from, it wasn't readily available in large quantities around Poverty Point, so they're also being imported. Copper objects, which I can never find pictures of, but beads and pendants were also recovered from this site. And traditionally, these have been thought to have come from somewhere in the Great Lakes where a local copper forging tradition already existed. But some recent trace element analysis suggested that it might have been coming from the Appalachians instead of the Great Lakes. But it could also have been just coming from both, and the, the, they only tested six uh, beads, so it, it could be coming from both. Either way, it had to move a very long distance from its source to end up at Poverty Point. A black lead-based mineral called galena was also recovered here from areas around St. Louis. It's a soft mineral, and it can also be carved into things like fastening toggles and fishnet weights. Now, with all of these exotic goods coming into Poverty Point, we might be tempted to think that this is some kind of massive trade fair going on, at least in part. But there's a major and obvious problem with that interpretation. Nothing moves in the opposite direction that it was coming from at Poverty Point. So you don't see Galena coming to Poverty Point and then spreading eastward across the Appalachians. You don't see soapstone vessels coming in to Poverty Point and then spreading northward up the Mississippi towards St. Louis. Everything's coming to Poverty Point, being used there, and then being discarded there, and nothing goes back out. So what's going on? Well, in addition to the monumental complex being tied into the Lower Jackson Mound, which again is 1,500 years older than the rest of the complex, it's also tied to the movements of the sun. From both Mound C and a point on the east of the complex, which is a design point used to lay out the site, sunsets of both solstices and the equinoxes are aligned to the constructed mounds. So it's very likely that at these four times of the year, major religious festivals focused on sun worship were held here. Those owl beads are also particularly interesting on this point because in most Native American cosmologies at the time of European contact, the west is the direction that the soul moves towards the land of the dead, and the owl is an omen of death. So it's possible that the connection between the west, the setting sun, the owl, and the land of the dead were already part of the religion in a huge portion of the eastern woodlands as far back as the late Archaic. And this religion held its major festivals at the monumental earthwork of Poverty Point, a focal point where ancient Americans took pilgrimage, bringing exotic goods from their homelands, and certainly we're doing so for, for religious reasons, but also remembering that these are human beings, also to get to be a part of what must have been the most lit party imaginable 3,000 years ago. As always, if this subject intrigues you and you would like to know more, please leave your questions in the comments. That lets me know what other subject matter people are in interested in and what other videos I need to be making. And for those of you who made it to the end, thank you for watching.